can I run Ogren, the Organic Growers Research and Information Sharing Network. It's a little 501c not-for-profit and for the last oh, 12 to 15 years I've been working primarily with small grain crops and um, organic and sustainable growers in Pennsylvania, New York and about five years ago, four years ago, thanks to the River Valley Grain Guys, I started working with growers in New Jersey. So I'm delighted to be here tonight and I'm delighted to tell you, can I go ahead and share my screen? Is that all right? Yeah, go yes, for it. Yes, yes, please do. I'm going to now I'm going going to now go away because my it helps if you can if I'm if with my computer connectivity if you can just hear me not see me. So let me um it says host disabled participant screen sharing when I click on share screen. Oh, let me fix that for you. Uh, why don't you give that a try? All right. There we go. So far, so good. And um, it's not allowing. There we go. Okay. So here we are on the. Um, we're going to start with a little bit of an introduction. It's not. Um, it's not allowing me to advance my slides. Why not? Um, let me try one more time. It may be connectivity issues. So okay. here, here we go. Okay, um, if if I start having more problems, I'll just go back into the regular mode, and it won't be quite as as. Uh, you know, professional will go for it anyway. So I'm going to, we're a little bit, uh, what I'm going to do is just um, show you what we're going to be. Yeah, it's not letting me do that. So we're just um, going to go this way. Before, so I, before you start, if I could ask um, uh, all of our participants and guests, I think turning your cameras off might help with connection um, in case the, the connection might be slow. So if we could do that just for the moment and then perhaps turn them on for questions, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Sorry, that's a really, take it away. That's, no, no, that's a really, that's a really smart idea. So just to let you know what's going to happen, I have a couple of introductory remarks. Um, then we're, you're going to see a wonderful video that was made by Tony Kinnett, who's on, who's on our, uh, with us tonight. And it features Tom Zhang and Scott Morgan. They're both New Jersey grain growers, and they have just a lot of great stuff to show you, um, uh, especially about harvesting. Uh, we'll, that takes about 20 minutes. We'll go back into some production basics with me. And then Scott is going to talk, uh, give you the farmer perspective. We'll end up with some post-harvest handling um, information. And then we're going to get into a discussion. So be prepared. Don't be shy. Be writing your questions down. Um, I know there are a lot of there's a lot of, of uh, folks on the call that know a lot about this already. So just to let everybody key in, what do I mean by small grains and specialty grains? The big four, wheat, barley, oats, rye. Wheat includes the ancient wheats. They're all in the wheat genus, einkorn, emmer, and spelt. Then we have a pseudo cereal, buckwheat, and amaranth. Um, and then usually included with the small grains just because it, it's grown approximately the same where things like flax. Of course, corn is a grass um, and I will talk a little bit about open pollinated and heirloom corn. I've sitter hemp a specialty grain, although I won't be talking very specifically about that in this presentation. Now, apologize, many of you have seen this slide before, but I can't talk in a, um, in a uh, seminar on small grains without reiterating um, the most important thing for me as an organic agronomist and that is small grains are essential, essential for all sustained rotations. Any organic rotation should contain small grains somehow. And why is that? Because they're classic soil improving crops. You can see the scavenges nutrients like crazy and it's simultaneously sloughing organic matter into the soil um, 
and organic metabolites, which is tremendous for um, diversity of microorganisms in the soil. Then you can see another major attribute that happens to be Kit Kelly, a Pennsylvania grower. And you can see this is a red fife wheat crop, spectacular crop. Um, and the point here is the other thing that is improve, so Im essential for soil improvement is all this organic matter. You harvest off the grain, yes, and that does remove some fertility, but you leave behind this massive amount of organic matter that can be turned into the soil. And it just really, really um, makes for, for, uh, for, so for an improvement in soil health. And then the third uh, attribute of small grains, of course, is that they beautifully, beautifully can be intercropped with forage legumes. Um, forage legumes, you can plant them at the same time. You can relay them in. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And the point is they grow together beautifully. You'll have many, many experiments have shown that if you plant forage legumes and, and grain crops at the same time, you have almost, you have either no yield loss or a very slight yield loss. And once you combine off that grain, what do you have left? That beautiful legume crop that's sitting there fixing nitrogen and creating biomass. And it is, it's a tremendous attribute for any rotation. Then the, the last thing I wanted to make it clear is another reason they're so critical for rotations, and I'm talking to vegetable growers here now too, is that they're tremendous break crops. So they can, um, uh, they can destroy pest and disease cycles. They can suppress pest and disease cycles in um, broadleaf crops. Now, we've known how good these small grains are for many, many years, but they haven't been grown in the Northeast until least recently. Why can they be grown here now? Because they're now profitable. Why are they profitable? Because we have very strong consumer demand for locally and regionally grown grains. The demand is so strong that we still cannot meet it. That's why we're having some of these webinars, because there's more room for farmers to get involved with these crops. I, just a, other ways you can add value to them. I'm about to show you how it lifts your price up too. Um, if you grow some of the really rare grains like einkorn, emmer, or spelt, that can also add value. And then the, the a big, big factor is if you can process these grains on your farm, man, do you start to collect some money. Now, I just want to show you some sample prices in the local regional grain economy. These are prices that I've collected over the years and they're pretty current. Of course, they depend on grain quality. We'll be talking a lot about that. And also the seasonal availability. Some years, the, it's these crops are in such short supply that the, the prices are considerably increased. But before we, I'm going to talk a little bit about wheat prices here, but this, this is illustrative of all the small grain crops and especially crops. That table, I just looked up the commodity price for wheat, for modern wheat grown conventionally for the commodity market, it's $6.25 per bushel. There's 60 pounds in a bushel. So you're getting about 10 cents a pound. And often that price is going down as low as $4 a bushel. So contrast that with these prices. Transition organic, no matter what you look at in the modern wheat, if you grow it organically, you can, you can easily get with high quality wheat 40 cents a pound as compared to 10% a pound or less growing it conventionally. If you add more value, uh, heirloom red fife, for example, if you're growing it organically, it starts at about 80 cents a pound. Einkorn, even more expensive, even more profitable for the farmer. Uh, there are some caveats with that, which, um, which the folks on the video will get into. That's all wholesale pricing, direct to consumer and user, whether you're growing berries, flour, rolled oats, then you're talking two to seven dollars a pound. It depends on your market and the particular crop you're growing. So I just wanted to give you that as an introduction. Why are we having webinars like this? Because um, when you put these two things I've been talking about together, the agroecosystem benefits of small grains, plus the demand from the local food mo foods movement, this means that farmers can sustainably and profitably grow these crops. So I'm, without further ado, I'm going to uh, let the video begin.
Oh, are we right. letting the letting the video? <laughs> okay, yes, I'm, we uh, sure are. <laughs> okay, Tony. It's Tony, you let you. us know. Yeah, here we go. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Tony. <laughs> oh, fine, all right. <laughs> I had it had hit some buttons. Okay, all right. So, uh, hi, my name is Tony Kinnett, uh, a certified organic veggie farmer, as well as a, a photo video company, and uh, had the honor to work with uh, Elizabeth and her knowledge of grains. And here we are. That's my stalling, and I'm about to screen share. Okay. I think. There we go. <laughs> Tom Zhang. Been farming since 1977 as an adult. And so you have a, what we call a split operation, right? You have most, oh, yes. how many acres are in conventional versus organic? Uh, well, there's a little fewer organic than there used to be. There's about 250 acres, I think, is organic. Uh, we cut back a little because a distant farm organics require a lot more intensive management sometimes, and that is too far away to handle. And we just said, okay. You know, when you get things like rain or something that changes what you have to do the next day or the next week, that was too far away because we were all there. So, so we don't do that one that way. So, so what grain crops have, do you grow? Pine corn. Rye, oats, wheat. Uh, Tony, I think you need to unmute yourself. We can't hear the audio anymore. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. It happens. I can show them how a combine works here. A combine works like this. Cut the head off. Roll it and in between two surfaces, blow off the excess, and that's what you got, is the green. So the reason that it's called the combine is because it does two things in one shape here. And it, 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 it cuts it, and then it crushes it. And then this was such a big, you know, you've all seen the movies and pictures of people with a hand threshing grain that requires hours so when the combine came along, um, much, much later, of course, it, you know, what sometimes young young folks who are just getting into grain production, they don't have a strong farming background, they're often resistant. They say, oh, I'm going to size it. I'm going to do it by hand. To do this two acres of grain by hand, you know, nobody nobody makes it through that. A professional. For a professional with a size, of which there are none anymore. Yeah. It would take a minimum of two days. Well, I think I think just my, to cut it. That's not binding it. That's not there, threshing it. So, for example, my father was who was born in 1908. He could do it in the old country. <laughs> he he knew how to sigh. Yes. But did he want to sigh? No. <laughs> so the not. combine is a wonderful thing, and the great thing about combines is: can you spend a fortune on a combine? Yes. Do you have to spend a fortune? No. So people are often intimidated by a combine, but for grain for grain production of any, you know, you for commercial grain it. production, it's the, it, would you say, it's the, it's the essential. If you don't have one, you, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. You can, you can, you can they're custom combiners. Oh, yes. And you Get can. Get your neighbor. Absolutely. Oh, oh, that's 
actually, before you buy one, if you can get a neighbor to do it, that is the best route to go. But it has reliability is not the best. Yeah, so, the thing, the problem with small grains is they all tend to come at once, and so that's the difficulty in asking a neighbor. But it does, it does work, and um, it's also important to, if you're going to buy a used combine, to get expert advice. Um, on what to look for in a used combine because if you if you get something that's essentially junk it's just gonna waste your money so over in my organization that's one of the things I do is I'll help connect you with um, people that are dotted around the countryside who uh, mentors who can who can give you some really good tips but this but the other thing about this crop of course this is a very rare crop this is einkorn um, it's a very ancient grain one of the earliest ones that was uh, under cultivation, so 10,000, 14,000 years ago, this started to be cultivated. The great, there are several great things about growing einkorn. One, there's no copyright, nobody owns it. It's an ancient wheat, it's in the public domain. So once, you, so you buy the seed, you can raise it, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, it's very, this is a, this is a, winter, this is in the fall then. in the fall in october yeah. probably yeah. usually october right. 31st yeah um and so it overwinters and then it's ready to harvest in july late july um this was probably ready maybe a week ago but yeah we had rain, so yeah so you can so it's you can also plant einkorn in the spring and the interesting thing about einkorn is it's a potato all, every every variety we've had so far can be grown in the winter or the spring. That's very rare. Yeah. Usually you have varieties that are that have to be planted in the winter, and then there are those that are planted in the spring. So it's very versatile. You can see that it's lodged. It's started to fall over. And one of the things that we, we looked for in a variety was, was a strong stem to reduce lodging. This is, but this is not severe lodging. This is... I can get under that without any trouble. Yeah, I'm sure he. But but we in spots that we did, and um, but we've had when we had showers, they were showers with very high winds, enough that you wondered if they were going to break the windows and stuff. It was bad. But <laughs> but then that that and that's what lodges. In fact, it wasn't the first one. It was the one that came later. So. It really got hammered, and I thought it might be flat on the ground. In most places, it wasn't. There's just a couple places, but that was because it was where I had too much manure. So. And then you'll notice that when he broke that up to simulate what the combine does, those kernels are still in their hulls. Yeah. So most of the most of, of of the kernels that go through the combine will come out still in their hulls. This is an example of hulled wheat. The hulls are held very hard on the kernels. Modern wheat, no problem, except for some varieties. It can be a little difficult, but they, yeah. they freely lose their hulls in the combine. And so that's a downside for einkorn in that and have another processing step called the hulling. Fortunately, we now have small scale, very efficient, cheap dehullers that do einkorn. But anyway, this is a beautiful, he's done a wonderful job. Why did it put the seed? Can't grow organic or any small grain on small grain on small grain. Wonderful. Not here. You, you just can't do that. And rotation is very important. You'll have all kinds of disease problems. And that's something you learn. Well, I learned long before I went organic even. You just, you, you can, if you're not organic, you can put on a lot more insecticide and things like that to prevent things. And you can grow crop after crop of the same thing for a while. But it is Mother Nature that will just mutate whatever your problem has been, and it's going to come and get you. So, so the point that you made, Tom, is just it just shows your years of experience and forward thinking, whether you're growing conventionally or organically. That, that idea of crop rotation. So coming back, right? To and crop rotation, but I do crop rotation non-organically as well. That's my point. But it's not as critical. So if I get hit with some weather factor or something that says, it says, hey, you can't do it. Well, I have. In a way, a little more flexibility with the with the non-organic mm -hmm. than I do with the organic. Well, let's let's talk about the, the importance of you know you made a very important point that when you grow small grain grains, um, they're really good. They're really they're some of the best crops for the soil. 
but yes, it's good can, rotation growth. Yeah, but you can't you cannot grow them one after the other after the other. Yeah. You need to, and so the kinds of things that you would you would grow, um, you would put in the rotate rotation with your small grains and the organic rotation would be what other? Oh, uh, any kind of a legume usually fits in well with it. Um, and I don't always get to do all that, but I also like to be sure you've got to feed your crop. I don't care where it comes from. It can come from legumes, preferably in combination with manure and, and rotation. And, and manure is very important, I believe, anyway. Do I've you, seen much better results with manure than, than legume cover crops even. Do you have your own source of manure or do you have to buy that? Both. Uh -huh. Okay. Do both. And you know, for other for other Which is a help because of where it's where I'm buying it from, they need to get rid of it. And the regulations are such that they can't do it all there on their own place. So it works out very well, I think. Right. And then the thing that just to broaden the discussion a little bit, one of the reasons that it that these small grain crops can work for for vegetable farmers, you know, is because there's nothing better to rotate your broadly vegetable crops out than into a small grain. Sure, like a rye. I sell a lot of rye for cover crop organically, and most of it goes to vegetable growers. And then if with this kind of, with the new market for small grains, um, especially if they're organically grown, that rye can actually be grown as a, as a food crop. This is the smallest this, they made in 1980. So this machine, this model would have been made how many years ago? This is 1980. Okay, and you didn't buy it in 1980, did you? What, 96. Okay, so I mean, so you bought a used combine. Okay, and can you, you gotta go see, you gotta look in the tank and see how the grain is coming in, how clean or dirty it is. And then you gotta check the back, preferably while it's running, and you can see if it's really flying out the back. And then you get behind the machine completely into the windrow where your straw is, you move the straw, and well, I guess officially you should take a grid one foot by one foot and see how much is there. I haven't done that in years, how but, much, but it, uh, visually there? I go like that and say, okay. How much, enough. how much, what is there? How much, how many kernels then are in a square foot? You, you do not want the kernels to be there unless they're bad. Yeah, you don't mind one or two, but you don't want to see a whole bunch. Right. And you don't want to see them flying out the back. And so what do you do then if, 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 um, well, you have to adjust your air and you have to adjust your, your sieve and your concave, which are two different, two screens, basically. And so you, you, it's a combination between your, your, your sieves, chaffers, that's your screens, and the air that's flowing through it. So you have to just get to know that and get it adjusted. And then when you're looking in the, it also helps when you're looking in the bin. If you're getting a lot of light stuff in there, then you know you need more air. And, oh, and also when you're sitting in the combine, if you hear a lot of return grain coming from your, what's called the tailings, it's the stuff that gets, it's heavy, it goes to the back and comes back through to get re-thrashed. You start hearing a lot of that, you know, you're getting too much. So you need to adjust for that as well. That usually means adjust your screens. Um, if you're finding grain that's not thrashed out, then either the speed of your cylinder is too slow and you need to speed it up or vice versa. If you're getting kernels that are chopped up, you've got to slow it down. And or you have to change your clearances between your rotating drum and your concave, your stationary surface. So it, correct me if I'm wrong. So if you're, if you're, taking, if you're getting smushed grain or bits of grain, you would, you would adjust both the speed and or that distance between the concave. Right. And, and, you, the, and you kind of need to know where you're at. I uh -huh. mean, you might, you might say. Hey folks, we are going to, I'm going to try to reconnect in a way that we get better audio. So just, I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to restart the screen share. Needs to fight. All of us need to be concerned about head blight or scab. It's Fusarium, primarily Fusarium graminarum. That's a fungus. It affects wheat, barley, rye, corn. They are major hosts. 
What does it do? It can drastically reduce yield, but even worse, it can make RM infection sometimes lead to production of vomitoxin. Vomitoxin does exactly what it says. It can cause problems for humans and animals. So we always want to keep the vomitoxin in a finished product at one per part per million or less. Now, how can you tell if you might have a Fusarium infection? You can, there are indicators in the field. You can see where my cursor is. This is from a wonderful Penn State, Penn State Extension Bulletin. You can see these tan sections of what should be green heads. That's Fusarium. If it's a really moist season, you'll also see these pink concretions around the kernel. That's Fusarium. What do the kernels look like that are affected? Well, here you can see a handful of, these are normal current kernels. Look, they're plump, they're nice red in color. Contrast that with a Fusarium infected kernel. You can see it's whitish, it can be shriveled. These are called tombstones and you do not want to harvest those because they're just going to add to problems later on. We'll get to that in a minute. So that's Fusarium. It's a major problem for us. How do we fight it? Well, a really good way to fight it is with a good rotation. In principle, and we all know our organic principles here, you alternate grass, i.e. grain and broadleaf crops, use that um, that Fusarium inoculum that's in the soil. By the way, the I don't know if I mentioned this, but that's held in the soil in un, undecomposed crop debris. So that's what's causing the Fusarium infection in many cases. Um, moving right along, what does this mean specifically for small grains? Avoid growing wheat, barley, or rye after each other. Because corn is also a host, it's not a good idea to grow say wheat after corn. Some people do, but be very careful. You need to bury that corn debris so that you're going to reduce, you're going to try to uh, keep the inoculum level of the fusarium down in that field. I'm going to just whip on so we have plenty of time for um, Scott. You also heard Tom talking about feeding the crop. Sometimes people confuse a small grain cash crop with a small grain cover crop. Small grain cash crops need careful attention to fertility. So they don't require as much fertility as a corn crop, but they require, they're moderate, they have moderate requirements. So here, for example, from the Canadian Organic Growers Guide is an example of how much 70 pounds per acre of nitrogen. And this is about the same as you'd find for a wheat crop. Some of the small grains require a little bit less. The ancient wheats tend to require much less. If you put that much nitrogen on an einkorn crop or an emmer crop, they would lodge, they would fall over. So you need to be careful with that. One thing I really want to stress, danger, danger, danger. If you remove the straw, with the grain and take it off farm, sell it off farm, look how much fertility you're losing. You're not only taking that wonderful organic matter off your farm, you're taking nutrients off your farm. So I do not recommend selling your straw. That should really, that's a first principle of organic farming. That needs to go back to uh, help the soil. Um, very quickly, he mentioned manure. Manure is a wonderful source of fertility for these crops. They, of course, supply lots of NPK, but look at this. They're excellent sources for micronutrients. Don't, if you're using a good manure, you don't need to test for micronutrients in your soil very frequently because you're getting it from the manure. Um, and then he just mentioned also the wonderful legumes in New Jersey. You have a whole bunch of legumes you can use. Here are just some of them. You can also use uh, sun hemp as uh, Joseph Heckman at Rutgers has been suggesting. So you have real opportunities to put these legumes into your small grains and help your whole system work. A couple of other things real quickly, other essential management practices. You need to have timely planting. Um, uh, Tom is a very experienced grower. He'd never grown einkorn before in his life, but he's very experienced. He has good equipment. He planted a little late, October 31st. I would have liked to see it on there around the 15th of October at latest, but he, he pulled it off. He had a beautiful stand. Spring grains and winter grains, you got to plant them 
uh, spring grains as early as you can. Winter grains, it's the Goldilocks rule. If you plant them too soon, so in New Jersey, too soon would be end of, of August, early September. If you plant them, then they'll grow like Topsy, but they're much more susceptible to leaf diseases. If you plant them too late, say in November, they might not get a good root system before freeze up. So it's the gold, it's not too soon, not too late. So think generally speaking, the last week of September, the first two weeks of October for you folks. Um, seeding rate, you need a good seedbed preparation, um, just as you would for, say, a, a vegetable crop. Seeding rate often has to be higher than for conventional production. So, for example, conventional spring wheat plants around 120 pounds per acre. Organic growers are going to put it on at 150, sometimes 180 pounds. Um, you, the exception there uh, is einkorn again. That can be planted in the fall at 45 to 50 pounds per acre. Joe Heckman and I did a study that actually showed that it didn't need to be planted. It, it, that's because the ancient wheat tiller so much. From one seed, you can get many, many stalks and many, many grain heads. Okay, and just a little bit on weeds problem. If your field is well prepared and you get a good stand, au contraire, that fall grain crop should be suppressing your weeds. Um, spring grain crops, it's a little dicier. That's where if, if weeds are going to come in, they usually do. Um, you can use tine weeders uh, once, the, once the grain crop has come up, the two to four leaf stage. Uh, some, some growers do. That can help to suppress the weeds and suppress weed seed set. Uh, but really a great thing for spring for spring planted grains is just get them in as early as you can. That that gives them the best chance of of being able to overcome any weeds that are that are lurking there. So with that, I'd like to um, and and feel free during the question section. I know um, I'll do that pretty fast. But Scott, would you like to take over? Sure. Scott, uh, happy to. Yeah, here I am. I'm here. Yay! There you are. In the in the background here, we're actually in the barn, so you can see that that's the the, the famous combine from the video, um, and. The bag here is a bag of wheat. You can still see the tube sticking out the top of it from um, when I had it drying. Um, doesn't hurt to just leave that in for a little airflow in, in case, um, you know, anything weather-wise changes. So um, I was going to talk to you guys a little bit about the post-harvest handling, um, the importance of timing on, on getting the crop harvested, um, and those, those things are really essential. Um, I personally, I don't have big giant grain bins. I don't have a heater um, to, or, or a, a propane or, or a natural gas fired fan to, to, to heat and dry the grain. I really rely on ambient air. Um, so for me, I am walking the fields um, starting in late June to start watching the, the, the wheat and the oats. Um, and I have a, a real small soil or a grain moisture tester. Uh, actually, hold on. I'm going to step out of the frame. I've got a real small one. I don't know if that's in focus. Yep. This thing take like a couple of teaspoons, uh, maybe, a, maybe two tablespoons of grain. And this I can walk out into the field and grab a handful and just fill this little cup with grain and put it in and, and clamp it down and get a sense of where I'm at. When that starts getting into the, the, to the range of reasonable for me, which is 18, 16% moisture, um, that's when I want to get out. I want to find the, the hottest, driest day um, once the grain is in that range and I want to pull it off. Um, if I pull it off, any earlier than 20% moisture, I will not be able to dry it. It will mold in the bag. It, it'll, it'll just be wasted time, wasted effort for a ruined, ruined crop. So you really have to get the moisture right. Um, for pretty much everything that I've ever seen for any crop, you really need to get it down to about 13 and a half, 13.5% moisture to be optimal. Under 14, you're pretty darn safe. Um, 
but really the kind of optimal range is, is down around 13.5. Um, I do that. You saw in that video, that's a simple dust collection fan from a, from a wood shop. Um, I picked that up at a, at a yard sale and uh, re replaced one of the capacitors to, to make the motor start up properly. Um, stuff like that, it, it's simple. You don't have to have a 20 foot diameter, 30 foot diameter grain bin the size of a house to get this stuff done. Um, you can get it done as I have with, with PVC pipes with holes drilled in it. I surround those pipes with window screen, which keeps the holes nice and small. So the grain doesn't just flood the pipes. Um, but it lets lots of air flow through. So I think I hooked up, um, six or seven bags this year and, and each one of these bulk bags had, you know, I think I had four bags of wheat and uh, a couple of bags of rye and a couple of bags of, of oats all hooked up to the same system um, because the air is all pulling out. I'm not causing moisture to build up in one bag that might be wetter or drier. Um, you just kind of keep constantly keep airflow through there. Um, and then, you know, rainy days kind of set you back. In fact, rainy days, if you can get away with it, you might even turn that fan off because you might be adding moisture. Um, in some cases, if your moisture is too high, even if it's humid out, you want to just keep running those fans because you don't want to, you don't want to uh, run the risk of it starting to compost in there. You want to keep that temperature down. Um, so that's kind of the, the drying side. You heard from Tom and, and from Elizabeth um, a lot about you know manure, the agronomy of it. Um, that stuff's important. I, I, I absolutely rotate as well. Um, like to rotate the the. I'll go even fallow before the my wheat crop, and then come into the oats after the wheat because the, the oats don't seem to need quite as much of the the nitrogen. As Elizabeth pointed out, uh, I always leave the straw behind. In fact, I have a flail mower these days, so I chop that that straw up real fine to leave it back in the field. Um, when it's chopped fine, it does tend to digest back into the soil a little faster, which helps me feel a little bit more comfortable that I'm not leaving, that I'm both feeding the soil the residue, but I'm not leaving too much. It's recalcitrant. It's not going to disappear or get digested before um, my rotation completes because yes, fusarium Fusarium will just make a crop completely unsaleable. Um, I, I, I'm like a poster child for some of what Elizabeth is talking about. Um, at the beginning, she's pointing out the difference in, in market opportunities and sustainability, not just being how we treat our soils and our rotations, but how we market and how we earn our uh, cash flow from the farm. So everything that I grow, I sell uh, retail. I'm well, a little bit wholesale, but mostly retail. I sell in these one pound bags. Um, I go to farmer's market like a lot of vegetable growers do and, and take that, those finished grain products straight to market. Um, and that has gone a long way towards making our farm at a small scale, um, profitable and effective. Um, Trying to think of what else I missed there. What crops do you grow? So I grow oats, um, modern wheat, um, einkorn, rye, um, all of which sell very readily for me at farmers markets. Um, I grew some buckwheat this year, but haven't quite taken it to market because I'm not satisfied with my ability to get it cleaned and uh, dehulled. Um, what else we grow? I keep trying chickpeas. I keep trying chickpeas and legumes that can be a cash crop. Um, haven't quite gotten to a point where I can get that to market yet. Um, so for now, the legume in my rotation are generally a white, you know, a nice low growing clover, um, either relay crop that is sowed under, uh, the existing crop. So it's there after I harvest or, or sown soon after harvest to, to let a field rest for a little while under a, a clover cover. 
Um, so, Scott, a couple of things that we haven't gone through yet. Um, you like to get your take on it. So I have I had wanted to talk a little bit about grain quality. Would you agree that that's extremely important um, in this market? Yeah, absolutely. So when when we get that the, the, the harvest out of the field, one of the first things I do is clean a small sample and send it off to the lab. Um, there's a lot of them around. University of Vermont has a, a big grain lab. Um, there's ones out west you can get a little bit less expensive um, as well. You, but you want to get it tested. Um, the retail market isn't necessarily quite as aware, but a lot of our our, our home bakers, you know, they want to know what your protein percent is. They want to know about your falling number. Um, they want to know about some of these these markers, these indicators of quality. So you want yes. To so so let's just. Take a minute there. Can people hear me at the moment? Can you hear me, Scott? Yes. Okay. Let's yeah. let's stop there for a moment because you just said something very important. So growers are responsible for testing their grain. That's a that's a cost you guys have to deal with, and it helps you because it helps you figure out what you, what you maybe should be doing better. Um, you know, if you're having low protein, well, what does that mean? If you're having a low falling number. I'll talk about that in just a second. What does that mean? But very importantly, you've got to test that vomitoxin because not only your market is riding on that, all of our market is riding on that. We have not had severe problems with vomitoxin getting to consumers. That's because we're testing it. And I hate to use testing, 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 because we're all thinking about that in another regard. But that's critically important. And Scott just mentioned falling number. Falling number is very important to bakers and millers. It, it, it's testing um, the sproutedness of the grain in the field. And that's being done at a cellular level. There's being, as soon as the gra grain is physiologically mature, it's gonna start thinking about germinating. And what does that mean? Enzymes are going to start becoming active and one in particular, amylase, is gonna be converting starch into sugar. If too much of that happens, then your grain becomes what we call sticky grain. And that's sticky, it, ca it causes the phenomenon called sticky dough. So what is a good falling number? A superb falling number is 300 seconds or above. A poor falling number is 200 seconds or below. So that's one thing the farmer has a lot of control over. How can you avoid a low falling number? Get your grain out of the field when it's ready to come out. And, and Scott just, just talked about that. You can't take it out when it's too wet, but um, you have to be extremely you timely harvesting. Um, I have a, a slide I won't show you now, but you can see later on when you look at the whole, uh, small grains are not like corn. They're like tomatoes. They need to be harvested at a particular time. If you don't, every day they go through wetting and drying with dew or rain events, they're losing quality. Protein is decreasing, falling number is decreasing, and your chances for vomitoxin buildup is increasing. So I'll stop blathering at the moment, but what he just brought up about the testing is extremely important. And um, I will have for you a list of laboratories. There's a laboratory in New York State now too at Hartwick College. It specializes in malting, but it also does standard grain tests, the University of Vermont, and then there are a whole bunch more. Um, so, uh, Let's see, Scott, what else do we really need to cover before we put it over to the questions? Um, well, I'll just, I'll just throw in a couple of words about that combine. Um, the, the, we just got a, I saw a piece of a, a chat come through with a question about it. The combine that I'm running is the, the Gleaner E. It's, it's only a 10 foot head. This is a, a small combine. It's not as small as they come. Um, but you know, I, I essentially got it for free. I just had to get it running. Um, they can be exceptionally expensive. Uh, you know, a modern machine the size of the one that we saw Tom running for me was completely out of range. I could not afford it. So this one behind me is a Gleaner E 10 foot head. They can be found out in Lancaster still um, in various states of operability I anywhere from you know, like I find mine for almost free to, to maybe two to four thousand dollars completely operational versus, right. you know, 50, 60, 80, 100,000 dollars for a used machine that's 10 years old. 
Right, and so we're lucky that there's still a lot of these small scale combines, both pull behind the very famous all, 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 uh, Alice Chalmers all crop. They're still available. They're even uh, shorter cuts. Uh, 60 is a five foot cut to 72, six foot cut. Then there are the, the, the small self-propelled of which one, uh, one of which um, Scott has. But I have seen farmers get perfectly good combines for $2,000. You have to look, a great place to look is at Lancaster Farming. And also let me know, let Elizabeth at Ogren know because I have very experienced farmers who are looking out for equipment for me. They know farmers need these pieces of equipment. They'll call me and then if I know you're looking for one or let farmers around you know, but that's the way to do it. Um, you do not need to spend, you could spend 15,000, you could spend $250,000 on a combine. Is it worth it? No. How much, just before we turn to questions, how much uh, maintenance and, and how much does the maintenance cost you for your machine, Scott? Uh, that's perfect. So I just saw a, a chat question come across from, I think it was Deborah asking how, who maintains these things recent, uh, locally. Um, so that kind of ties into the how much do I spend. Um, I, I, I've probably got somewhere between three five hundred dollars that I ended up spending every season on on an old machine like this. The old adage about you know once you get a car payment you always have a car payment whether it's maintenance or a loan. Um, it, it goes it's somewhat true with your combine as well. I mean you're going to get a two thousand dollar combine, but every season you need to look it over real hard and watch for a bearing that's lost a seal or a belt that looks like it's going to break during the harvest. Um, or, you know, I, I, there's always something. Um, I yeah. tend to do my own maintenance, um, call in help from a local um, auto mechanic who's willing to stop by when I get in uh, over my head. Yeah. And that's, what's really nice about the organic community accent on community because if, when you get clusters of grain farmers growing close together they're usually mixes of very experienced people very mechanically minded people and the opposite and so i know here in new york state right around me there's a new group of farmers just a, they're about five of them in a cluster about 40 miles away from me and they have really been helping each other with with combines one of them is an expert with alice chalmer repairs plus you can find parts for some of these old combines still so again if you if you need that kind of help if you need mentoring contact ogren that's what it's that's what it's here to do is to connect farmers together that can that can uh, help each other so I think we're, we're at about uh, 7.03, and I know there are a lot of questions. Um, so, so Scott and I will take these questions. Do you mind, Scott? Um, Happy. Okay. And um, before we start the questions, I wanted to show you if I could screen share for just a second. So I think that'll mean you going off for a minute, Scott, and I'll screen share. Um, All yours. Okay, so here, by the way, can you guys see this now? Here is a, whoops, no, you can't. Um, so here, by the way, is an is a AC all crop pull behind 772. Um, I'm going to make available to you on the web, on the Ogren website, for those of you that are not familiar with combines, um, some diagrams that show you what Tom was talking about in terms of the concave, the cylinder, and so forth. But I, what I really wanted to show you is this resource page and key in on these upcoming webinars. We've got one coming on the 26th next week on cleaning and storage, and then November 2nd on um, processing and marketing. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and maybe Scott, you can get you you can get back on your screen share. Yep. And I think we can take questions. So when what, we take questions, it'll be really important for everybody. What? Sorry, one of the um, if if we can take questions, it'll be. If when you're asking a question, feel free to put your video on. But as soon as you asked your question, if you could shut it off because we're going to have, it's going to be harder for all of us to maintain connectivity. So go ahead, Scott, you were going to say something. Uh, a question came in already on the, on the chat asking about the horsepower on the fan. 
Um, that is a very low horsepower. That's that's a fractional motor. That's probably a quarter horsepower fan on that uh, on that dryer. Um, it's definitely not any more than a half horse fan motor running that. Um, just it, it's all about consistency. It doesn't have to have a lot of power. It's just got to keep going. Yeah, and I see this. Do you need different combines for the small grains than the legumes? Not no. really, no. Especially, you know, the all crops, the all crop machines, one of their great claims to fame, and it's true, is they can do just about any crop. Um, but you have to maintain them properly. And, and one thing about the all crops is they're old now. They stopped being manufactured in 1968, I believe. So maintenance is going to be a key. But yeah, you can, you can. Uh, pretty much combine uh, this all the small grains and the legumes with a single with a single machine. If you're gonna I, produce a lot of beans, if you're gonna do something like a a, a, a turtle bean or a um, you know a, a, a black IP something along those lines, you may need to consider a, a bean combine, which has got some different mechanisms for kind of beating those out of the hull a little bit more. Um, but that that's a that's a, a little bit of a different ballpark from the small grains. Yeah, then there's a question on processing. It uh, Scott, it says it looks like you had rolled oats in the bag. Um yeah. so you you have an oat roller, correct? I do. Uh I have a I have an oat roller, um the simple pair of, of uh heavy rollers. So it's a single pass. Um I have a, a, a D huller that has worked very effectively for um, einkorn. Um, uh, what else? I've, I've got in the background right over my shoulder there is a, an old clipper air screen back there. Um, that's, that does the majority of my, of my grain cleaning. And I've also got a, um, a Carter disc separator, which is a, a, a tool that, that does a little bit fine a little bit of a finer job grading um, the sort. It, it's really kind of, a, I found it to be a bit of essential for me to get oats to the point where they're clean enough to, to be marketable. Okay, and um, remember that we're gonna go into um, cleaners and storage next week. Aaron of, uh, um, Aaron Gabriel from um, the uh, cooperative ex Cornell Cooperative Extension in the Hudson Valley is, has a great presentation. And then you'll see Scott again in our last presentation on processing and marketing too. Um, there's a question, is, my, is the PowerPoint going to be available? Absolutely. And Scott, can you remind us of the planting dates you suggest for winter planted and spring planted grains? Yeah, so the, the winter stuff, um, you can get rye in late September. You know, most of the folks in my neighborhood say that if you get your wheat in before September, you're at risk of, of affecting all of us in the neighborhood with uh, the potential for Hessian fly. Um, so we, we, we tend to push until October 1, um, try to get it in between October 1 and October 15, optimally. Um, the einkorn I put in in the same window. I don't want to put it in too early, but it can handle going in later. Rye can handle going in later as well. So can uh, spelt, but but the the key is spelt is 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 the most robust of all the crops. It's even more robust than rye, and it's a wonderful crop. I'd like to see more people in New Jersey ding 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 grow spelt, but keep in mind that it's still good you're going to have less risk this is all about managing your risk you're going to have less risk if you can get it in that sweet spot that goldilocks spot of late september early october try as hard as you can to get it in by the middle of october after that your risk is starting to increase you can do some things to to help yourself you're going to have to increase your planting rate there's another question here. Um, what do you think is the minimum acreage to justify owning and operating heavy equipment? You cannot, uh, oh, and then also, are there services available to have people come and harvest your crops? If yes, what do you think the acreage would be to economically justify doing that? You maybe didn't hear this at exchange. It was, it was in the video, but Tom and I both said, yes, you can, there, you can get your field, fields custom combined. It will cost you. You can also ask a neighbor to help you who has a combine. That is risky. 
because the neighbor is nice or as wonderful as he or she may be, when these crops come in, they all come in at the same time and people are going hell to leather. So I know there's somebody on this call that thought he had a, it arranged for the farmer to come over and, and combine his crop and the guy just never got to it. Boom, you lose your, you lose your crop. So um, the, the reason that, that Tom and I went so hard into and in how important the combine is, you know, you, you need a combine to do this stuff. And so if you're growing a mixture of grains that amounts to two to five acres, be thinking about getting a combine. Maybe the first year you can arrange to have it custom combined. I don't know how much that costs. I can find out for that and post it on my website to get a little indication. Do you know, Scott? Uh, I don't know offhand. There are some resources you could find it. Uh, USDA has some phenomenal statistical resources in that regard. And you, you, if you search up USDA custom custom combining costs, you can probably find a breakdown by state. It might right. not have to be listed because not as much of it happens here as would happen in the Midwest. But you can use those Midwest numbers for at least an idea. Um, right. I have yeah. I have had a neighbor help me once but it's something that you can't rely on uh he really saved the day for me one season with some oats that had lodged and and i had a breakdown but it, it's desperate straits i mean like you said it you, you really need your own machinery because everybody's going at the same time um, and, re and really don't be don't be scared of a combine we're talking i have seen people get perfectly reasonable combines starting at five hundred dollars Okay, yep. but so you, you can, you know, and certainly for a thousand, twelve hundred, you can get a good combine and you can learn to take care of it. You can certainly learn how to use it. Another thing, though, once you get your combine, you need to protect it. We didn't weren't able to go into this on my resource um, page uh, on the you are on the um, PowerPoint. I have given you a, a wonderful resource. It's called Mastering the Combine, and it features Tor Oshner, a superb organic small grain grower from New York State. And he talks, he takes you through the combining process. But one of the things he said is a combine is a piece of machinery that should not stay out in the field. It needs to be protected. I, if you can't put it under shelter, then you need to tarp it. OK, it, because it's it's your one piece of essential machinery. You can farm small grains without a drill. You can farm small grains without almost any other piece of equipment. But a combine, believe me, you you need it. And it is not a terrible thing. It's your friend. It's your friend. You'll sometimes thump it and kick it, but it's your friend. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, no. So part of it is. Um, uh you know, that, that, that falling number, those quality issues that we touched on earlier, if you can't get in at the earliest opportunity and get that grain off, you're really leaving yourself hanging out there. You, you can, you can, your falling number can go down and make it, you know, a, a, an ineffective grain. You're, you're, if it stays out in the field and it gets too wet too many times that you, you can turn a little bit of fusarium into a lot of fusarium and you can go from having a, a, a crop fit for human consumption to having something you can't even feed to your pigs uh, yeah um, i wanted there a couple we're almost out of time there are a couple of questions that have been coming in that have been asking about the minimum number of acres to grow that you can grow to have any kind of realistic economy of scale here's the here's the deal we this grain market has busted burst wide open the old oh economy of scale you've got to grow a more that is not what this market does. This is an artisanal market. So think about it. Scott, how much do you market your, your einkorn for per pound? I sell the einkorn at market for $7 a pound. All righty then. Think about these small grains like you think about high, veg high value vegetable crops. I have micro growers that are growing small grains. They're growing small grains on less than two acres. How can they get away with that? Often they're growing other crops, they're growing vegetable crops, because the whole, this whole market, this new market says no to economy of scale. It says yes to locally regional marketing strategies and to grain quality. So if you want to get started by growing a quarter acre, a half acre, a whole acre, you can find a market. And that's one thing that, that Ogren is standing here to help you with. 
okay? I'm not a broker. I don't get paid for this, but I can help connect you. And by working with the community, working with growers like Scott, uh, with some of our wonderful mill owners, Small Valley Milling, um, Farmer Ground Flour, River Valley Grains, you, you can get your feet wet and, and that's the whole point. This is a this is can be a profitable yeah. enterprise for you. Yep, I saw I saw a question come in about deer and deer pressure. Um, we did put deer fencing around the farm this year. That was to allow us to, to to grow a wider diversity of things. They they have particularly beaten us up when we've tried um, edible beans like the chickpeas and lentils. Um, we have a, eight eight foot in New Jersey is generally sufficient. Uh, Ninety six inch fence. Um, that being said, you can grow a lot of these small grains if, if you're focused on, on wheat and oats and, and einkorn um, without the fence. Uh, they really, they might graze on it. They might graze on your winter wheat. They might graze on your einkorn. Um, and, 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 but they're not going to devastate you. Um, yeah. Um, what we've seen is, you know, the, the deer will lay down. They'll bed in it as much as as they eat it um i see something just came through about starlings uh on the holus oats that i grow the the birds picking the grain out is kind of a big deal but again early timely harvest so having your own combine and and watching that crop as it gets close to maturity and and, and nearing a harvestable moisture content it'll go a long way to get you out of any trouble with with um with bird damage um so uh, just, just, a, just a few more seconds to, to, to talk about the birds. Um, try to grow things like hollis oats, not in a field that's surrounded by a hedgerow. That will give you much more bird pressure. Also in smaller acreages, let's say you're growing a quarter of an acre of oats, a bird tape is extremely effective. It gives you an extra week to 12, you know, a week to 10 days, which sometimes can get you you know, you know about birds and raccoons. They'll go in just when the crop, just before you're ready to go. So if you can, uh, so y these are not trivial issues, but most farmers are able to, I think Scott is absolutely right. Most scar farmers that I know do not fence their farms. If you have a fence, if you're a vegetable production um, farm and you already have a fence, okay, hey, that's fantastic, but you don't, you, you don't need them. Um, although Rob is saying he's, his deer have been very hard on oats, um, 30 to 40% loss. So the other thing to keep in mind is if you do have heavy bird pressure, then grow, you need to grow more, you need to grow a larger field of, of oats, for example, um, that can help to, to, to make sure that you get, you get a profitable amount of crop. So I think we're kind of running to the end here. And I just wanted to mention, I hope this is okay. Um, th those of you that are interested in growing grains, um, growing grains organically, please be in touch with NOFA New Jersey or Ogren, because we have all sorts of things that are coming up, um, opportunities for growers. So um, this, is, this isn't, you know, this isn't the be all and the end all. It's not a silver bullet for grower, growers, organic small grain production, but it's a, it's, it's quite possibly a, a, a profitable enterprise for you that you can either do solo or mix and match with other farm enterprises, vegetables, dairy, um, field crop farming, whatever, whatever you're interested in. So with that, I think we'll, we'll turn it back over to Nagisa and Amanda, I guess. Okay, well, um, Elizabeth, thank you so much. Um, this was an amazing workshop and um, you answered a lot of the questions that were in the chat. I think we'll try and go through um, and glean out the rest of the questions so that we can um, try and follow up with everyone in case we missed a few questions. So feel free to email us and we'll follow up with you, um, send out a link to the full workshop so that you can review it um, look at the video a little bit more, et cetera. So thank you very much for participating. And we encourage you to sign up for next week and the following week as well. <clears throat> All right. Have a good night, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks to everybody for participating.